Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our first session of today. Very excited to introduce our first speaker, Joa Vaknin, who actually submitted his dissertation last week. So, cause for celebration. <laughs> So he is, or was, a doctoral student in the Department of Archaeology at Tel Aviv University and in the Paleomagnetic Lab of Professor Ron Schar at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He's participated in excavations at numerous sites, over 40 sites, including Tel Dor, Jerusalem, Kiryat Yarim, and Timna. I think a number of them are shown up there. His doctoral research, which was done in collaboration with a team of archaeologists, Physicists and historians used paleomagnetic methods to date important biblical sites and is published in the Proceedings of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. He was widely reported on in the scientific and popular press. He's a guest lecturer at SES 2023. And we're excited to hear him today talk about using geomagnetic fields in biblical archaeology. Thank you very much. It's really a great honor to be here today. Um, so thank you, everybody, and Steve, for the invitation. Um, I want to tell you about my uh, PhD thesis, all, all my results, which actually um, introduce a new dating technique, a new dating method to the archaeology of the Levant, especially in biblical times. And um, after 20, more than 20 years, that the, the big the big debate about the chronology and the archaeology of the, of the biblical times was focused mainly on radiocarbon. Now we have a new technique that can help and narrow down the, the debate and help uh, resolve this uh, important debate. So uh, a quick outline of my talk. I'll start with a brief, very brief introduction of the, the method. I'll just say a few words about experimental archaeology, some like what we did to, to make sure that the method really works uh, in the lab. And then <clears throat> what we call site formation in archaeology. This is when you want to understand the finds that you see in an archaeological site. <clears throat> Sorry, what exactly happened there? Um, and how it's kind of like the police work. If you find things, what, what, what went on here, especially with uh, fire-related uh, destruction layers. And moving on to the main thing uh, I'm ta I'll talk about, which is archaeomagnetic dating. And after the summary, there'll be time for questions and answers and comments, of course. Um, so the magnetic field of the Earth um, changes over time. It's not constant. It changes. And uh, when we're talking about the magnetic field, it's a vector. It has a direction and, uh, and intensity. So the direction, to make it easier to understand, we divide it into uh, the, the vertical component and the horizontal component. And the angle between this horizontal component and the magnetic uh, and the geographic north, which is the axis of the spinning of the Earth, so it's, it doesn't point to the, uh, to the geographic north, but it has sometimes points to either side. So this is called declination, this angle between the horizontal uh, component and the geographic north. And the vertical uh, component, the, the angle between our vector and the horizon is called inclination. <coughs> And the magnetic field, sometimes it's weaker, sometimes it's stronger. So the intensity here, it's uh, depicted by the, the sizes of the arrows. And this changes over time. Maybe you've heard of, uh, of um, reversals when it completely points in the other direction. But in the periods I'm dealing with, it doesn't, it, there were no reversals, but it changes. It's sometimes weaker, stronger, and it points in different di directions. So this, we can use this as a chronological tool. Uh, what does uh, archaeology have to do with this? So, Maybe many of you have heard of um, uh, geological materials which record the magnetic field. We were just talking about yes, lava flows and so on that they use in tectonics and, and stuff like that, that uh, the basalt rocks that record the magnetic field, also sediments in the sea, etc. But what I deal with is archaeological materials that record the magnetic field, and they do this exactly like the, in, uh, in basalt rocks. For example, once they're heated, to a certain temperature, they, any previous magnetic field will be erased. And when they cool down, they record the magnetic field. This is because uh, they, these materials, especially clay minerals, they contain um, ferromagnetic uh, minerals often. And these uh, minerals, you can imagine them like a tiny needle of a compass. Yes, that's, the needle of a compass is a small magnet in itself. 
So uh, it creates a small magnetic field and uh, when it has the freedom to move because the way the compass is built, it will prefer to align with the ambient magnetic field. But unlike the uh, needle of a compass, what gives the minerals, the ferromagnetic minerals, the ability to move is the, is the temperature. So above a certain temperature, they, they have the, uh, the, the magnetic moment will prefer to align with the ambient field and below certain temperature, it's stuck, it can't move. And we can come thousands of years later and take them to the lab and measure this magnetic signal and we can reconstruct what the direction of the field was and what the intensity of the field was at the time of the firing, or more accurately to say, at the time when the, after the firing when it cooled down. So this is how it works. If we take, for example, this uh, ceramic uh, kiln, yes, so the, the kiln itself, the walls of the kiln are built, built of mud bricks, and they, they contain these ferromagnetic minerals, and also the, the ceramic, ceramic vessels, they also contain these ferromagnetic minerals. So we can use these to reconstruct the magnetic field. The problem is if we want to reconstruct the direction of the field, we need to find the, the, these uh, objects when they're in their original position, where they cool down. So for this, we can use only the, um, the walls, the mud brick walls, if they're found intact. But to reconstruct the intensity of the field, we can use also the bricks and also the, any ceramic vessel. Um, <clears throat> so this, I'm uh, moving on to this, the first part of the, the talk after the introduction, the experimental archaeology. We, what we did, uh, I won't go into details here, but th this is a paper that's now under review in PLOS One. We took, uh, um, we, we created miniature mud bricks and we magnetized them in the lab under controlled conditions and then we demagnetized them in the lab by heating them in a zero field environment and we showed uh, that this, uh, this tool of, uh, this is a very common tool in archaeomagnetism and paleomagnetism, people use this all the time, but we used it to to show if some material is burnt or not burnt and to reconstruct the magnetic, uh, the magnetic field. These are the miniature uh, bricks here and, and this is the paleomagnetic oven that we used we, uh, to, to magnetize and demagnetize them. And what we showed is that we can, we can tell that something is burnt if it, the clay materials, uh, clay minerals, we can say that they were burnt from 190 degrees Celsius and up to up to 700. And this is really uh, great news because other methods that are commonly used to say if something is burnt or not burnt usually can tell only from 500 degrees and up. Um, so we can, th these lower temperatures are very important. And we can also accurately reconstruct the, the heating temperature, which is really great. So this is the results of the, of the uh, experimental archaeology. The next thing we do is site formation. Now, my PhD and also this talk is focused on archaeomagnetic dating. So why is site formation so important? Um, here, for example, this is a paper published in PLOS One, uh, my first paper in 2020. This is about uh, the Earth's magnetic field recorded in Jerusalem in the, when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians uh, in 586 BCE. So we, we recorded the magnetic field that, that was found in some, some uh, special uh, uh, surface, I'll show you. So what, somebody could say, well, maybe this magnetic signal was recorded when this structure was built, not during its destruction. And then the date can be 100 years earlier. Yes, if it's the time of destruction or the time of construction, it's a big difference. So this is why the site formation is so important. So this, is the, this is the site of, it's called Givati parking lot. You can see it here, just, uh, just below the Temple Mound, um, just to the south of the Temple Mound. And this is a very steep slope. You see the, you see here, this, today, this is all was built, in the, especially in the Roman period, it was built, so it, there, there was, uh, a lot of building going on. You see this is a very, very uh, high elevation here. But originally, this, this is the city of David Ridge here. And this is a very steep slope going down to the west. Uh, they still didn't reach the bottom of this. So they're working the, their way down. And in this uh, excavation, they, they called me and they, they said they found this very interesting um, surface. This, this is a, a surface. It, it's built of uh, very uh, distinct layers, the bottom layer is um, made of limestone. See, this is limestone. Here you see only the, the one, one or two centimeters of it, but originally it was like 15 or 20 centimeters thick. It was very, very big, made of crushed limestone with some cement material to keep it together. And the top layer was built of, uh, was made of very fine grained uh, material with uh, pieces of, of uh, calcite. 
to make it look nicer. That's kind of like uh, terrazzo uh, floors that people use, have today. So it was really, really very special and we never saw such a thing from such an early period. We didn't know exactly what it was and, and some, somebody suggested maybe it was burnt. Maybe it was magnetic since it would, maybe it was fired, but we didn't know and maybe, maybe it recorded the magnetic field when it was made if it's crushed and burnt material and so on and maybe it was uh, and maybe there was a uh, destruction by fire we really didn't know and I sampled this and as they worked down they they uh, found more and more pieces of this uh, of this uh, surface you see this is a two and a half meter from here this is the floor of the bottom story of this building and this is two and a half, more than two and a half meters it keeps going you don't even see the whole destruction uh, layer this is full of stones and, and, and ash, and uh, you see a charcoal marked here in green, and in red, more and more of these uh, segments of this surface were found there all over the place. Here, a few of five of these uh, segments are lying on the bottom story, on the floor of the bottom story, but some are, are standing vertical, and some are further higher up. Um, so so they, they are all over the place, and um, Clearly, they fell down from a higher elevation and broke. But did they record the magnetic field? And, and, uh, and in, did, can we use this as a chronological marker? So what I did, every time they found these uh, segments, they called me when they, they exposed the top of them, but they didn't move them yet. They called me up, and I came and I marked these horizontal lines, and I um, measured their, the field orientation. I removed it, took it to the lab, cut it into small specimens, and measured the, the magnetic signal uh, recorded in them. And these are the results for the direction. So out of 38 segments that I sampled, uh, out of, sorry, 42 uh, segments that I sampled, 38 of them are clustered clearly to the north and down. Yeah, this graph here shows you, uh, this is north, east, west, yes? And the center here is, is a vector pointing uh, down. The outside of the circle is a horizontal uh, vector. So you can see all these 38 segments here are roughly pointing uh, to the north and about... The this is... Uh, no, th this is the geographic north. This, the zero here is geographic north. So, so here you can see they're roughly pointing, yes, to the geographic north, by the way, with a slight positive declination, so the magnetic north here is not exactly to the geographic north, but slightly to the east, yes? If, if this is like the center, the, the average of, of all these samples, and about 50 degrees down, somewhere here. So this, this shows that these segments clearly uh, cool down more or less in the orientation in which they found them, we, we found them. So, because I measured the orientation in the field and I corrected the direction recorded according to the field orientation and they still gave me directions clustered together. So this shows, this is a very clear cut that these, this, the magnetic signal here was recorded after they collapsed. So even though they were all over the place in completely random direction orientations in the field, the direction in them is clearly not random. They, they collapsed and then cooled down. Then they recorded the magnetic signal. So this, this clearly ties between the destruction and the, uh, and the magnetic signal. Now why didn't they give me exactly the same direction? Why, why are they scattered around? So this is, again, it's a de destruction layer. So some of them moved slightly this way, some moved slightly that way, just because you know, there are air cavities and pressure from, from uh, later periods, uh, from the construction up above and so on. So, so you have this scatter. Now, why did these four segments give me completely different directions? So there are two possi possibilities. One is that they didn't collapse with, with all the others. They remained in their original position. They, they were heated and cooled down in their original position. Maybe they were on top of a, uh, one of the walls or something. And then after they cooled down and recorded the magnetic field, only then they collapsed. So that's why I got completely uh, different directions. Another possibility is that they, they collapsed with all the others when they were still hot and cooled down after they collapsed, but then they collapsed again significantly. Like these moved a little bit. For some reason, here there, were, there was a more significant movement and they moved more, so they gave completely different directions. Now this uh, enables us to really understand what happened here, to reconstruct the, what we call the site formation processes. So, this is what the archaeologists, by the way, thought also before my research, 
the, the excavators of the site, but I proved, my research proved that this is, was actually what happened here. So the, the surface we were talking about was actually a monumental floor. Originally, the monumental floor of the fancy second story of this structure. Now, because the structure is built on the, on the very steep slope of the city of David, we think people that came, they came down from the city of David directly into this second story. So this is like the entrance to the building. And the bottom story was kind of like for storage or something like that. So this is why they, they invested this, all this work to make this incredible floor uh, on, the, on the second story. And this was made on, on top of these wooden beams. They found these huge wooden beams. They found them in the excavation, like 20 centimeters in diameter. These huge wooden beams strong enough to keep this floor uh, intact. Now, what happened? There was a very strong fire here. And of course, at some point, these wooden beams failed. When they failed, everything came down, co collapsed down, but everything was still boiling hot. And only after it collapsed, then everything started cooling down. So this is why we have this, um, this the, the directions uh, were recorded, on, well, most of the segments were recorded only after this uh, amazing collapse. Now, when did this happen? So the dating here, this is important to understand, it's not based on archaeomagnetism. The dating here is based on historical sources and archaeological data. We know that the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem uh, from, in 586 BCE. We almost know the day. It's August 586 BCE. And we know, um, how do we know that this is August 586? Of course, we don't know the exact date from archaeology. But the archaeology here was very clear. The pottery is uh, very typical for the end of the Iron Age. And um, we find all kinds of uh, uh, finds there that are really common in the end of the Iron Age, including seals and seal impressions. Yes, some of them uh, uh, bearing names of people known from the Bible. Yes, Nathan Melech, the, the Eved Melech, it says, Nathan Melech, the, the servant of the king, uh, somebody known from the Book of Kings. So it's very clear that this, this structure was used in the end of the Iron Age and destroyed by fire according to our results, so all, everything here fits perfectly together to say that this is the 586 Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem. And if so, we know, we know about this destruction from the Bible. Yes, we have um, in, the, in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Yes, so we know the date. Um, yeah, of course, there are some arguments if it's few days earlier or later, but of course it took, it took it several days to destroy this uh, amazing city. So, um, but we know this guy, Nuvuzaradan, one important uh, uh, person in the, in the Babylonian army, he comes with his people and he uh, destroys the city by fire and, and there is an emphasis. What did he destroy? He destroyed the house of the Lord, the king's house, all the houses of Jerusalem, every great house burned, he burned down. So, he, he, besides the temple and the, and the palace, he, he, there was a special emphasis on destroying the, the uh, elite houses, the administrative houses. We think these are the people that were behind the rebellion against the Babylonians, so there was a, a specific focus on their houses or, or the administrative houses. And we think it's very clear that uh, the archaeology and history here all point that this house that we worked is one of those administrative houses, these elite houses destroyed by the Babylonians in 586. We reconstructed also the intensity of the field. So the direction here is mainly for the site formation. We can't really use it because it's not um, good enough to, to get an accurate direction of the field, but the intensity of the field that we measured from this floor, now we can use it as a chronological marker for 586 BCE. This was the, this, the intensity of the field in Jerusalem in 586 BCE. So we have a very, very, we really pinpointed the, the intensity of the field here, and this can be used for archaeomagnetic dating of other sites. Moving on to another example of site formation. Um, here, this is uh, again on, in the same paper that's now under review in PLOS One. Uh, after uh, getting, we, we, we developed this method of, rec of, of identifying burnt materials and reconstructing, and reconstructing their firing temperature, we, we used this on a case study. Uh, in, uh, why we, we tried to understand if some burnt mud bricks, if they were burnt during, uh, before construction, uh, if they were pre-fired in a kiln, or if they were fired uh, in situ during the destruction of the site. 
or maybe twice, maybe also uh, before and also uh, during the destruction. This is a paper published by another team uh, f regarding the 9th century uh, BC destruction layer in Tel Esafi, Gath, Gath of the Philistines, you know, hometown of Goliath. So um, they, they uh, worked, this was published in 2011 in the Journal of Archaeological Science. They worked on this uh, archaeological context. What you see here is a mud brick wall. You see, this is, a, this is one mud brick here. You see another mud brick here, and then another course down here. Very clear uh, bricks that are still standing in their original position as part of a wall. And next to them here, you see, this is all collapsed material that fell down, but it was heavily burnt uh, to high temperatures, uh, lying all the way down here. This is a segment of the roof of the structure, probably. And this, by the way, is a human skull here, number two. This is, a, this is a photo taken from, the, from their paper in 2011, and this is very well dated to the destruction. This is um, attributed to Hazael, king of Aram Damascus, in about 830 BCE. This is mentioned very briefly in the Bible. Um, yes, so that, that he came and, uh, and uh, captured Gat. Gat, of course, a Philistine city. It's not the main interest of the biblical uh, source to, to say what happened. That, uh, the Arameans attacked the... the, the um, the Philistines is not uh, the focus of the Bible, but it's mentioned very briefly because it was probably a very important uh, event. Got the, at this time, Gat was the biggest city in the in the entire um, in the, the entire region. So um, uh, we went back to the same context. We uh, this is the same wall, uh, mud brick wall. We some of the bricks were removed in the previous excavation. We measured, we sampled the outside of these bricks in the same method. You see we marked these horizontal lines. Also the collapsed material, also the bricks on their outside, and also in, in some cases we cut, for example here we cut the brick in half. You see here we cut it in half, we removed one half of it, and in the inside of this brick we measured, we, we wanted to see if the, the recording of the magnetic signal was to the north and down, and to what temperature was it, it was heated, and also um, to see if it's all the way into the brick, so if the temperature is the same and the direction is the same all the way inside the brick. If it was pre-fired in a kiln, we'd expect a direction pointing in completely different directions, but if it was fired in situ, we'd expect a direction that's to the north and down, also from the burnt material in situ and also from the collapsed material. So these are the results of the directions. Again, the same as I showed you before, you see, all of them clustered roughly to the north and down. Um, these, for example, give a slightly different direction. These two, they're of course from collapsed materials. So again, they had these slight movements. So these are not good enough when if you want to reconstruct the, the exact direction of the magnetic field. You can't use collapsed material. We use that only from the in situ bricks that are still in the original position. But, you, but, but for site formation, this is very important. All of these, also the collapsed material, everything cooled down in more or less in the orientation in which it was found. And this is very important for site formation. Now we have also the direction and also the intensity of the field recorded in, in uh, eight, about 830 BCE when this uh, destruction event happened. So we showed here that uh, a few conclusions that are completely different from the previous research I showed you. We showed that the, this structure was built of sun-dried mud bricks and not pre-fired bricks as they claimed, that there was a fire that occurred within this structure and not only in its vicinity as they claimed. We showed that the structure collapsed during the destruction event, not decades later as, they, uh, as was suggested. And uh, we, we, we raised this question if actually pre-fired bricks occurred in Israel before the Roman period. Now, there, in some cultures, like in Mesopotamia, people fired bricks way be, before this period. But we think that in Israel, this was not, this did not happen. It's not practical. This, for example, uh, in, in Genesis, uh, the book of Genesis, in the story of the uh, Tower of Babylon, they say <clears throat> they found this, uh, uh, they found this area, this uh, plain, and then and then they said to one another, "Come, let us make bricks." and burned them thoroughly, and they, and they had brick for stone. So the brick was used as what we, whoever's writing this, yes, in, 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 in Israel, we know we use stone for this, but they needed to burn the bricks and, make, and, burn, and use burnt bricks because they don't have stone over there in Mesopotamia. But in Israel, 
we have stone. If you want a very hard, uh, durable um, building material, you just go and get stones, uh, uh, natural stones, and you use them for building. You don't need the, to burn bricks. Only in the Roman period this began, uh, the burning of bricks and tiles and so on. For So this, this uh, shows that, um, I, I think, that at least in this case, but we showed it also in a few other cases, that this was not uh, commonly done, at least I don't think it was done at all, burning bricks uh, for construction. Now, um, I, we showed here how, on one hand, to identify burnt materials, reconstruct their firing temperature, and the directional results, all this combined together leads to complete different understanding of the uh, fire-related destruction layers. Now, this is very important because we use these bricks, the intensity and the direction recorded in these bricks, as a marker for the Chazael period. If, it was, if these bricks were pre-fired, then again, this could be 100 years when this um, structure was built, maybe 100 years, maybe not, maybe more, who knows. So now we, we know the intensity and the direction of the magnetic field during the times of Chazael when he destroyed the gut of the Philistines. So all this to get put together can be used for archaeomagnetic dating. This is the paper that was uh, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science just in uh, last October. And uh, what we did here, we, we went to the, the, same, the same work that I did in Jerusalem and, in, and here in Gat. We did this in 21 destruction layers in 18 different archaeological sites and used this for uh, archaeomagnetic dating. Now, why is this so important? During this period, we have what's called the Iron Age chronology debate. This is the biggest debate in archaeology in Israel and maybe, maybe even worldwide because it has to do with the historicity of the biblical text and the, the united monarchy of David and Solomon, did it exist or not? This all has to do with, the, with the, this chronology debate. Why, why do we have this debate? So on the one hand, we know from, from the Bible and other historical sources of Egyptian, Aramean, Assyrian, and Babylonian military campaigns. And on the other hand, we find in archaeology all these destruction layers, very clear destruction layers that cities were destroyed. But to correlate the, the destruction layer on the one hand and a, a specific historical event on the other is very, very complicated. Uh, and, and, not, and often very debated. Uh, and this leads to the, what we call the Iron Age chronology debate. Here's a, these are two papers published in 2011 in Near Eastern Archaeology, and this is still more or less the situation today. So there are two groups, more or less, that uh, some say the chronology is earlier, or some say the chronology is later, and this leads to, yes, to conclusions regarding the, if the um, united monarchy of David and Solomon ever existed, and so on. It depends what, on this chronology debate. And to make things even worse, there is what we call the Hallstatt Plateau. This is a plateau in the radiocarbon calibration curve. So when you take, when you take uh, things for radiocarbon dating, you, have to, you get a date from, from the lab, but you have to calibrate this according to the changes in the radiocarbon uh, um, in, the at in the atmosphere. And, and during this specific period, from 800 BCE and on, radiocarbon is uh, almost uh, not used at all because the, the error bar you'll get because of the plateau in the calibration curve will be almost the, the whole period. So people usually don't even use it for dating. It's very common and very efficient, very great uh, tool for dating earlier periods and later periods. But in this period, specific period, it's almost uh, irrelevant. And, <clears throat> and the good news is that we have chronological anchors. We have some specific sites. These are most of them. These are those that I worked on. We have maybe one or two more. But these are sites that we know when they were destroyed because we have a rare combination of historical sources on one hand and, and archaeological uh, data on the other that really fit together perfectly. I talked about Gath of the Philistines, northern parts of Israel destroyed by the Assyrians in it's around 732 BCE. We have Lachish III. This is uh, the most, maybe the most famous example. The Bible talks a lot about the, the Sennacherib attacking uh, Judah in 701. And uh, I, the Assyrian sources then also talk a lot about this campaign. And there is the famous Lachish relief. So there is a huge relief. It's like 20-some uh, meters long and three meters high. It's now in the British Museum. It was found in Sennacherib's palace in Nineveh. And, he, and there he shows how he conquered the Lachish from the beginning of the war until the, the destruction of the city and the people leaving for exile. And, and it says there, it says that the city of Lachish, the name is mentioned there. So we know that this is the destruction. And in the archaeology of, this, of the site, Tel Lachish, they found 
the, the Syrian siege ramp and more than a thousand arrowheads shot by probably mainly by the Assyrians, maybe also by the, other, the defenders of Lachish. So it's very, very clear. And then we have the Babylonian destructions of, in 600 BCE and Jerusalem in 586, as I mentioned, and uh, another uh, Lachish. What we did, we took these um, mud brick uh, material, as I said, um, here, here, for example, you see this is stone foundation here. This is made of stone. And the mud brick, which was originally sun-dried bricks, uh, but here they're still in their original position. So here we can do also direction and also intensity on a mud brick wall like this. And we did this, this work in uh, 21 destruction layers in 18 archaeological sites. And these are the results. It's, um, don't worry, I won't explain all, <laughs> all the results. It can take us uh, a whole day, but um, whoops, what have I done? Um, so here on top, you can see uh, the intensity of the field here and the direction here, declination and inclination, and the different sites uh, that are dated. The, the dates that you hear, see here, the error bars, are according to other archaeological data, radiocarbon when available, the, the historical data, and so on. Some of them have very small error bars, and then they're marked, they're bold here, like Gat of the Philistines here, or um, Jerusalem, see here, that are in bold. This is because they were, um, we, we, we call them chronological anchors. We know when they were destroyed. The others, we put them with larger error bars. And then we built a Bayesian model that ch looks at the changes in the magnetic field. These, the colored ones, are the destruction layers. But it, this Bayesian uh, model works also on other data, previous data from Israel and from Syria, from, from all, kind, all uh, archaeological sites. So we have the, the changes in the intensity of the field. And uh, the error bar, the possible error bar, according to yeah, the error bar, sometimes it's larger. Like here, it's larger because we don't have a lot of data in the seventh century. But when we have the, the data, and the data is clustered together, the results of different sites that were destroyed, like here, these are all attributed to Hazael in 830 BC. So they're cl clustered together, so the error bar is smaller. Uh, and this enabled us to reconstruct the, um, the different military campaigns. You can see uh, the, these, the, these military campaigns are uh, constructed not only from our data, of course, it's uh, historical sources and, and archaeological data, but in some cases we could narrow down the dating and, and, and say that this site was destroyed in a certain military campaign, campaign or not, and, and, and narrow down and, and get a more accurate reconstruction of these uh, biblical military campaigns. So I don't have time to go over all the, all the conclusions from this research, so I'll focus on one, and maybe if I have time, maybe two. This is a, a site in Beit She'an, in northern Israel. In this uh, site, they found uh, an amazing destruction layer, four monumental uh, structures. You see this is a stone foundation here, and then the mud brick superstructure. This is one of the, these structures. They found uh, uh, four of them, and they were destroyed by fire, clearly. And the problem here is the date. When did this destruction uh, occur? The, the ceramic assemblage is very clear. This is what's called the late Iron 2A. This is the focus of the chronological debate. Yes, some people say this is 10th century, David and Solomon, and so on. Some people say, no way, this is 9th century. This is Omri and Achab, yes, uh, uh, the, the kings of Israel, the later uh, kings. So there's a big uh, argument about when this is dated. And radiocarbon, even though in this period, radiocarbon is, is a great tool, but they, were, they had no uh, radiocarbon results from these structures uh, that could help date the destruction. So we were left only with the, um, the pottery. Now, the, according to the pottery, the excavator of the site, I'm, I'm Professor Amichai Mazar, who also excavated, um, uh, I said Tel Bechian, and he also excavated nearby Tel Rechov, which is a site five kilometers to the south of Beit Sheyan. He he said um, he said I, I don't know I, I I don't know what the date is he, and he just gave two options. One is that it's the late 10th century or maybe early 9th century, and at some point he suggested it might be attributed to Shishak, yes, Pharaoh Shoshank, biblical Shishak, who uh, um, conquered claimed he conquered some sites in Israel in the late 10th century. And if so, he suggested uh, that it might be contemporary with Rehov 5, a, st a stratum in Tel Rehov, called uh, Rehov 5, with an apiary, beehives that were uh, burnt also by fire there and destroyed by fire. So maybe it's in the same time. Or another possibility is that it's late 9th century and attributed to, it, to Hazael, king of Aram Damascus. And then it's contemporary with the later destruction in Tel Rehov called Rehov 4, the huge destruction of the, of the city. Um, 
the problem is the pottery from Rehov 4, Rehov 5, and Beit Shean is the same pottery. So if you have only pottery, you don't know the date. It's the, the two options are possible, and Amichai Mazar, recently, when he published the final report of Tel Rehov, he, he said, well, I, don't, I still don't know what the date is, maybe this, maybe this, but I prefer the later date, the, the 830 BCE, the late 9th century destruction by, the, um, by Hazael, king of Aram Damascus. But our, um, the magnetic data tell a completely different story because you see these sites are all attributed to Hazael, you see Rehov 4, Gat of the Philistines, which is the chronological anchor you see here, and another site called Chovat Tevet, the direction of the field, you see exactly the same direction, a perfect overlap of the directions here. Yes, this is north, again, north, uh, so we have a positive declination and an inclination which is very uh, high inclination, more than 60 degrees here, and Beit She'an is, is a different direction, so the direction supports a time gap between the destruction of these uh, sites. Moving to the intensity, again, you see um, Tel Rech, uh, Gat of the Philistines, Rehov 4, all, all the destructions attributed to Hazael king of Aram Damascus up here, give the, the great overlap of the error bar, so really fit nicely saying that, yes, these were really destroyed by Hazael king of Aram Damascus, but Beit She'an, you see, well down, down here, Beit She'an, Rehov 5, and another destruction layer uh, of Tchorvat Tevet, Tevet 7. So the earlier destructions, Tevet 7 and Rehov 5 and Beit She'an, they all have a much weaker magnetic signal, much weak, they, they recorded a weaker magnetic field, so it's very unlikely that they were also destroyed by Hazael, and it supports a much earlier date um, for these sites. Now, wh what we could do, we could use this uh, for actually uh, archaeomagnetic dating. What we did is we, um, we gave the model, well, our uh, Bayesian model, we, we, we said, for example, Beit Shean, we, we don't know, we have only pottery, no radiocarbon, so we gave a very large age range, 940 to 820 BCE, and any, any, age, uh, any age within this range is equally possible for the model. Uh, but the model takes into account also the intensity of the different sites, and you see the, earlier, the, early, the, the later dates for Beit Shean are completely outside of the, of the green error bar here, so they don't fit with all the other sites. And then the model says no, the, this, the, the blue is the probability density for the date, and you see the earlier you go, the higher the density is up to here, so somewhere here, 900 or even earlier than 900, maybe 920 some, sometime here, is the most probable date for the destruction of Beit Sha'an. Now this is v v really a surprise, because if this is true, then this is exactly the time, there's of course arguments also exactly when the, the campaign of Shishak, Shoshank occurred, but it's somewhere here. Some people, the, the traditional date, according to the Bible, the, the date is 925 BCE more or less. So if so, so maybe Rehov, uh, Beit maybe these sites here were destroyed by Shishak. Now Shishak, how do we know about Shishak from the Bible? It says that he came and, and conquered some sites and, and went to Jerusalem and got a uh, tribute, so he won, like Jerusalem surrendered. Uh, but also we have uh, uh, this amazing relief from Egypt, from Karnak, Egypt. This is the god Amun. This is in the temple of the god Amun in Karnak, in Egypt. And, um, and, uh, and also the, the king himself, the pharaoh Shoshank, is depicted here on the other side. You don't see him here in the picture. And He's bragging that he conquered all these sites, and you see all these people here? These are prisoners of war, yeah? They have their hands tied behind their backs, and every one of these is uh, depicted as a prisoner of, of war. This is a city that he claimed he conquered. Now, two of these, side by side, are Rehov and Beit She'an, because he claimed he conquered these two. They're side by side because geographically they're very close, they're five kilometers apart. So he claimed he conquered these two sites, Rehov and Beit She'an, and we have the perfect magnetic uh, agreement between these two sites, and the difference here from the Hazael pu pushing their date earlier to the times of Shishak. So maybe we found the two first examples for sites that were destroyed by him. There are many sites that he claimed he destroyed, but none of them, there, there is no agreement of, about any site today that was destroyed by Shishak. Some scholars say, well, maybe he, he came with this uh, campaign, but he didn't conquer, or at least he didn't destroy any sites. And other, I heard a lecture recently saying, very extreme in my opinion, saying that this campaign never occurred. Yes, the Bible said it occurred. He says he, he, he had this campaign, but people say, well, it never happened at all. 
I think that's very extreme. But here, maybe we found the two first examples that, that of sites that actually were destroyed by him. Um, I think I'm out of time, so um, I'll, I'll just uh, I'll just mention briefly. We have this. Uh, okay. So this is one other example. This is a paper that's just been accepted uh, for publication recently. Archaeomagnetic dating of the outer revetment wall at Tel Achish. I talked a lot about Tel Achish. So Tel Achish, this is a, um, a reconstruction of the site. There is, they, they always thought there was a wall on top and another wall called the mid-slope wall or the outer revetment wall. This wall going all the way around the south. This, this wall was actually found already by the British expedition in the 1930s. But the date of this wall is very uh, debated. Yes, this is a, when the original, or the traditional thought was that this wall was in use at 701, in 701 when the uh, Syrians uh, attacked the, the city of Lachish. You can see a, uh, like a drawing showing the Assyrian army attacking the city, and the city has two lines of uh, fortifications. Yes, so, uh, so this is the traditional uh, idea, but recently, um, the, the Hebrew University excavations at the site uh, pointed to a much earlier date for this wall, a thousand years earlier to the Middle, middle Bronze Age. So uh, ruling out, uh, in my opinion, it's not very likely that this wall was in use for more than a thousand years. So if it was built in the Middle Bronze Age, it couldn't be in use in the time of, uh, of Sennacherib. And uh, this uh, started a very big debate. These are just two papers just published recently uh, saying uh, this can't be, uh, it has to be Iron Age, it has to be in the time of Sennacherib. There's a big debate about this wall and I found the wall is mainly built of stone but some of it is built of, built of mud brick and here just in the corner, uh, southwestern corner of the site there is a, uh, a, t a mud brick tower that's combined inside this uh, fortification, this wall and this, you see here, this is the Assyrian siege ramp. The siege ramp covered this wall at some point so I went to this wall. This, here you can see the wall during the excavations here. This is the, the wall. The wall goes all around the site. You can see it here. It was excavated. So you see the line marked in red. And this is the, the tower I, I worked on. Here you can see that tower, the mud brick tower. And we measured the intensity of the field recorded here. So this is the intensity of the field recorded in this. I gave it an age range from 1800 BCE all the way down to after 701 BC, all this is a possible uh, date, but you see the intensity with the arrow bar fits perfectly only with the spikes, the very high intensity events that occurred here. So, and it fits perfectly with 701 BCE, the destruction of Lachish that was from the city, we, from the city gate, we took the intensity. So this points clearly that it couldn't be built in the Middle Bronze Age, but it had to be from the Iron Age. And that, combining this with the archeology, span it has to be 701. They found, as I said, more than a thousand arrowheads. Many of them were just in this corner around this wall. Even some of the arrowheads were stuck in the wall itself. So I think it's very clear that it was destroyed during the fire of 701. Who destroyed this? And one option is that the, 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 the fire was uh, led by the people of, of Judah. You see here the people that defending the city, that are throwing these are um, torches, that they're throwing at the Assyrian army, trying to burn their uh, siege machines. Um, but I think even more possible is that the Assyrians themselves lit the fire. This is, a, this is from a, a relief of, uh, depicting the siege against Thebes in Egypt. You see this soldier here, it's an Assyrian soldier and he's holding a torch and trying to set the city on fire, the city gate in this case. So I think this might be a, uh, the, the Assyrians tried to burn this wall. Like you can see here in the biblical narrative of Avimelech, where he, he attacked uh, strongholds. And this is the book of Judges. He, he, he brought a lot of wood and burning material and, and set the, the, the stronghold on fire from the outside. But the, fire went, the flames went up and destroyed the city and, and the fortifications of the city. Um, and this is like uh, part of the tactics uh, of, uh, against the siege, like the siege uh, tactics of the, in this case of Avimelech, I think this might be the case also in the, um, of the Assyrians. To summarize the, the talk, um, we, we really have a new additional uh, chronological tool for the Iron Age chronology debate after more than two decades that were focused mainly on radiocarbon. Uh, and the, what we have here is the, the, the site formation on one hand tells us connects between the, uh, the data, the magnetic data and the destruction of these sites. 
and we have high resolution dating of the sites that's based mainly on the historical sources. Yes, we take the very well dated historical, historically dated sites, we know when they were destroyed, we use the magnetic data as a chronological marker and to date other sites. And this is very important specifically in this period because we have on the one hand the biblical uh, historical events and this huge chronological debate that we can maybe help uh, uh, resolve and uh, the Levantine Iron Age anomaly, the anomaly in the magnetic signal, the magnetic signal during all this period, during the Iron Age was more than, it was very, very strong, including uh, episodes of more than twice as strong as today's magnetic field. So this is very, very interesting. And, and we were able to pinpoint these events using this uh, historical data. Now we can take this data and date anything, any burnt material from, the, from this period, any piece of pottery, any, so we can go back also to sites that were excavated in the past and, and in the future and, and, and date them according to the magnetic signal. Thank you very much. Yes, I might have missed it, but what is the actual magnetic field sensor that you actually use? Is it a Hall probe or something like that? I mean, you, you, your initial slide talked about the demagnetization, but did, did I miss something? Uh, we, we um, I mean, we measure the magnetic signal of the, we use a squid uh, uh, mag magnetometer Thank in you. the That's lab. Thank you. That's what I wanted. Okay. And we, uh, we magnetize and demagnetize them in the Palo magnetic ovens, which I showed you, right? I didn't, meant, I didn't talk about the equipment. Uh, I had simply missed the word squid. Thank yeah. you. Is there any effort to correlate some of these ceramic dates with um, sediment dates and, and uh, mag, paleo mag um, from sedimentation like in, in uh, ponds and, and sediments like that? Um, yes, we. Uh, it's not my research, but in my lab they try to do this. It's uh, much more difficult because uh, in the in the sedimentation you also have the, the dating in the sedimentation is much more difficult because you don't have these anchors. You only can date it by radiocarbon, and um, and you also have something called the inclination uh, uh, shallowing. When, when sediments fall down, then the inclination shallows, and you can't use it for intensity at all. Or it's very difficult for intensity, only, only direction. So you can try to do that, but uh, it hasn't been very successful up to now. That was a great talk. I wonder what the um, factor is that limits the accuracy of the method. Is it the knowledge of the field at the time and at the, at the uh, Lo locale, or is it the way you measure it? So um, w the limits, also also the our measurements. We have some error bar, like any any uh, method. Also in the direction, and also in the intensity. I personally today I think that the intensity is more reliable than the direction because the direction doesn't change enough. It changes like five, 10 de degrees, and if our error bar of measuring it is a few degrees, so often we have uh, the, uh, the error bars might, might, be, might overlap. The best thing is when we have also direction and also intensity, as I saw, showed in the case of Betchian, if I had only the difference in direction, I would say, well, it's probably not from the same period, but I wouldn't be so sure about it. But because I had also direction and also intensity pointing to a different in time, then I can be more, um, more sure that it's really not from the same period. And um, the biggest problem is the, the, you, this method doesn't stand on its own. You have to rely on other dating methods. So what I was re very lucky here to have these very well dated chronological anchors so that I know what the magnetic field was at 586 BCE or 830 BCE plus minus 15, let's say, years. But if I didn't have that, if I only, so if I take any other period and I don't have this historical uh, anchor, so I'm, I have to rely on the other dating methods. So I have their error bar. So that's, that's a very big limitation for us. Uh, hi, great work. Thanks for the talk. Thank I'm you. curious, other than the Old Testament, what are the other sources of like written works and literature that you can use to compare these events with? So for the, for the Assyrian period, we have the, the Assyrians and the Babylonians, both. They had these 
they, they wrote down what they did and they, they, they bragged, of course, saying they conquered this and conquered that, but when you can correlate the, uh, like the example I gave of Lachish 3, so the Assyrians say they conquered all these cities and uh, Hezekiah, they, they, they closed him up in Jerusalem like a bird in a cage and so on. And, uh, and, and, and then they, they say we conquered Lachish and they have this all, uh, the relief showing how they conquered Lachish. And, and then we find a thousand arrowheads and so on and the siege ramp and all that in Lachish. So we have this great correlation. This is very rare. We don't often have such great uh, combination of historical sources, the Old Testament, uh, and the, uh, the Assyrian sources, but we do also for the Babylonian period, we have not for the destruction of Jerusalem so much, but almost because the Babylonians, we, not, we don't have, the text didn't survive for, for the 586 year, but just bef a few years before we have um, the Babylonian text as well. So those are the, the combination between the text and the Bible and, and the archaeology, that's what. Uh, um, if I may, two, two quick questions. Um, are there other areas on the earth where these techniques might help uh, date archaeological sites that you're aware of? And the second one is, how does this method uh, calibrate against, uh, say, radiocarbon dating? You know, are you getting the same answer that the radiocarbon dating people get for age? Where, where the overlap, where you can do both? So um, for the first question, uh, works like this have been done all over the world and here in the United States, uh, people have done work like this in Europe. Um, we can't use their data to, to date things because of the, the local anomalies, the magnetic field isn't uh, the same every place on Earth, so we have to have our own database. And I, I don't think that any, any work has been done in such high resolution like here. Um, it's, not, I'm not, it's not only my, uh, my work, uh, of course it's the the, the, there's a lot of interest in the archaeology of Israel, so it leads to a lot of data, historical and radiocarbon and all that, so we have very uh, high resolution dating from other methods, and then we can build the, the variation curve. To, so this brings me to your second question. We, radiocarbon, in, in the beginning at least of this period, we can't contradict radiocarbon altogether because they, they, radiocarbon gives you a date, uh, even with an age range, of course. But we can narrow down the, the age ranges, or in some cases, like in Beit Sha'an, you could date Beit Sha'an with radiocarbon, but they were, didn't find anything that, was, you, you, that could be used for radiocarbon dating, so we could narrow down the dating, which was relied on, only on, on, the, on, on, the, on uh, the, the radiocarbon from other sites and the pottery assemblage, we could narrow it down. So if you have two sites that were, dis that were that the, the radiocarbon dates overlap, between two sites, we can measure the magnetic signal and say, well, they, also the magnetic signal overlaps, so maybe they were really from the same time, maybe not. But if the magnetic signals don't overlap, they couldn't be from the same time, and then you could narrow down the, the error bars of the radiocarbon from both sides. So we don't, in, in most of the periods where radiocarbon is very, a very good dating method, this is not instead of radiocarbon, but it's an addition, complementary tool to radiocarbon. Thank you. Fascinating talk. And I, my, my question was a version of his uh, first question. In, in other regions, or even in, in earlier times in the Near East, uh, has this work already been applied to this, this method? To say, uh, Bronze Age, or even earlier than that, Uruk? Uh, so so in, other, in other regions, yes. In Uruk, specifically in Mesopotamia, there's hardly no work like this been done. I'm, we're, there is some work now that's being done now, and I hope to help also and be involved with that. And in Israel, yes, we did. The, there is one paper that dealt with the, uh, the entire Bronze Age from one site. They took Tel Megiddo, you know, our Megadon, and they took, um, they took uh, pottery from all the radiocarbon uh, strata from from Tel Megiddo and, they, and used it for, so we do have some reference, but it's not yet as, uh, as it's not a very large database as I presented here, and I have, I have data from the bronze, from the late Bronze Age, all the way, like the, the early Iron Age, I didn't publish it yet, I'm working on it now. Yeah, the last, great talk, by the way, the last site you talked about, I saw. Yes? Yeah, no, that one, next. There, are, there is another peak around here, 
How do you pick the 700 instead of the 1,000? Yeah, very good question. Um, so th if you take the magnetic data only, all four spikes, it could fit here or here or here or here. There are four spikes in the magnetic field during the Iron Age. The reason we rule out this one, uh, this is very clear, is that it was covered by the Assyrian siege ramp, so it couldn't be burnt after 701 BCE. It had to be earlier. It could still be in the 10th century, yes, around 1,000, as you said, but then we combine this with the archaeological data. So if you have uh, fire, when, and, uh, inside the, fi the burnt debris, you have uh, a thousand, more than 1,000 arrowheads, you know, and the Assyrian siege ramp that covers it and all that, I think the combination here with the historical sources, the, the archaeology and the, and the archaeomagnetic data point to the 701 BCE. But you're right, the magnetic data alone would leave the three options equally possible. This is what you, you can see here, these three, yes, this is archaeomagnetic dating, it gives three options, here around 1,000, here around the 800 and around 700. So the three options are equally possible. <laughs> 